I'm T. James Reagan, and this is the T. James Reagan podcast from Newark, New Jersey. The essay you're about to hear is a sequel to an essay I wrote probably maybe three or four years ago called In the Canyons of a Fallen Empire, uh, which you can read for free on tjamesreagan.com. I already know the comment you'll make when you retweet this article. White author defends white author about a book called White. The retweet will get about 43 likes. You'll revel in each notification, then two hours later, you'll reply with a tweet about your SoundCloud link. I get it. By all means, send the tweet, but it won't be accurate. The truth is, if someone is going to defend white, it's not going to be me. Mainly because of a grudge. A grudge I have with Brad Easton Ellis. I've had this grudge since about 2017. I guess I wasn't mad enough to not buy his most recent book, but the point still stands. The new book in question, an essay collection named White, begins with a description of an ill-fated Palm Springs trip that Brett took with a friend from his Bennington days. Reading this was a thrill because Brett's last novel, Imperial Bedrooms, contained a rolling, near-final scene in Palm Springs where life is brought to a crisis point in physical transgressions flow in scenes of unflinching, beautifully rendered brutality. In white, Brett has returned to Palm Springs, but this time, the transgressions are emotional. This time, only egos will be bruised. This time, a friend had a breakdown, and that breakdown coincided with the aftermath of the 2016 election. In my own way, I too went back to Palm Springs after the election, and this trip is the reason why my grudge against Brett exists. In my version of the Palm Springs getaway, I decided that I would write a novel about my election panic. My therapy would be laid bare on the page. This was a tactic I had learned from Brett, and it's why I call myself a post-empire novelist. I detail this post-empire process of turning pain into creation in my hot couture noir novel, Empire Waste. The novel is a story about a fashion designer with two muses. These muses were women in my life who caused me great pain, and I, in turn, caused them great pain. The first muse, named Lux, was an 18-year-old female friend and fan of my work who had joined a Seeking Arrangement site and had begun meeting with total strangers for a sugar baby relationship. To celebrate her birthday, I showed up at the now-defunct bar B-Side on Avenue B. Lux waited in the bathroom while I ordered us drinks, then we dipped into the back room. After a couple of gin tonics and a few PBRs, I strongly demanded that Lux get off the arrangement site and stop meeting with the men she had been in contact with. She refused and left for a freshman year at, strangely enough, Bennington College. My second Empire Waste muse was named Isabella in the book, and she was forced out of my life by my own jealousy, which caused me to make statements that I knew would inflict a precise hurt on her. I was attacking her already vulnerable self-esteem. My relationship with both of these girls was accurately rendered in the novel, and after its publication, the first muse reached out to me from her Bennington dorm room and told me she missed me. We now speak every day. Our most recent texts are regarding the sexual assault of her friend. She has to get on anti-HIV medication and all that, just to be safe. My second muse didn't react at all to the publication of Empire Waste, and seven years passed, with our only interaction being her briefly following me on Instagram, but by the time I checked the notification, she had already blocked me. It wasn't until two weeks ago that she reached out to me. We now speak every day. She's moved to Japan, so I have two clocks on my iPhone, one for the time in New Jersey and one for the time in Tokyo. Our most recent texts are about her breaking up with her millionaire boyfriend in a steakhouse on a tearful April afternoon. When it comes to Empire Waste, my characters were the people who I exchanged pain with, but for the post-Empire 2016 election novel I had decided to write, I wasn't sure who my characters would be. I didn't lose any friendships during the election because I didn't share any of my political opinions at all, whether on the internet or in those dimly lit bars over PBRs. This time, my pain revolved around a situation instead of relationships, and this was new for me. It forced me to start with a theme, 
So much of the 2016 election was about sex, from the hashtag I'm with her campaign slogan to the Billy Bush Access Hollywood tape. It seemed as though everything around me was being seen through the lens of sex, whether gender or pussy. With this as a backdrop, I decided that my novel would be about a guy who loves to give love and loves to get loved back. After writing those exact words in my outline, I thought, this looks familiar. I kept writing, and I couldn't shake the uneasy feeling that I was either retreading something I had already written in the past, or I was committing some sort of offense in a culture based on just that. I flipped the words over in my head, and I asked other people if they sounded familiar to them, but no one could place it. They shrugged it off with a demure, I messaged, IDK. It wasn't until I began detailing various sex positions and the associated pain my main character felt while assuming them that I realized where the sentence was from. I went to my bookshelf and removed numerous stacks of novels that were teetering in precariously balanced towers, and then I located Lunar Park by Brad Easton Ellis. I flipped the pages, stopping at page 90 where I read, This book was the story of Michael Graves and his young, hip Manhattan bachelor's erotic life, a guy who loves to give love and loves to get loved back. I plagiarized Brett, directly, without changing a word. Any other writer would have given up their stolen novel immediately, or at least they would have deleted the sentence in a moment of quiet embarrassment. Since my relationship with plagiarism is so loose, I once wrote an unauthorized, novelization of Richard Kelly's Southland Tales, and I once wrote a play for Shia LaBeouf with his relationship with Mia Goth, I decided, fuck it. I didn't remove the sentence, and instead chose to do the opposite. I transcribed the six pages of Lunar Park where the fictional Brett outlines the novel Outrageous Mike, then I added this transcription to my outline for my next novel, tentatively titled, What Else But Outrageous Mike. I had my framework, and I wrote around it. My rationale was that what could be more post-Empire than writing a fiction novel based on a fiction novel written by a fictionalized version of the author who created the term post-Empire? It was a Kirk Lazarus performance when the mere idea of a character like Kirk Lazarus could trigger a nation. Once I had this guide and Brett's main character, I decided that the novel would take place on specific days in 2016, leading up to the election, then stretching to Valentine's Day 2017, where, just as the fictional Brett ended his outrageous mic with a tense Valentine's Day dinner at Nello, I too would end my novel there. Since my process of writing is about exercising all the pain I have on a subject, I'm forced to write until my pain is gone. In this case, it took me eight months and 855 pages until I reached that scene at Nello, and when I did, I felt relief. I was done. I was done, and only then did the reality of what I had just devoted eight months of my life set in. During those eight months, I had neglected responsibilities, romantic interests, and my general health. Already skinny, I had shed weight. At one point, I stepped on a scale and watched as the digital numbers ticked to a troubling 117 pounds. I had avoided responsibility. I had disregarded key issues that would not go away and would only compound in complication as time passed. The most substantial question that I had avoided was suddenly the focus of my entire life. How do I publish a book where I don't own the rights to the main character, nor do I own the rights to the plot? Like any other good millennial writer with shitty problem-solving skills and a need for the easiest path to resolution, I took to Instagram and slid into Brett's DMs. On August 31st, 2017, I sent Brett an 855-page PDF of the completed draft, along with the message, Do you remember the manuscript that the character of Brett was writing in Lunar Park? Well, I finished it for him. In the way that American Psycho was about creating a physical image to fit in, Outrageous Mike is about creating a digital image to fit in. The novel takes place during the 2016 election cycle as Mike Graves curates an online identity following all of the correct opinions while secretly holding the exact opposite views. At this point, I requested Brett to give me permission, or at least agree not to sue me, if I was to try and get the novel published. 
Ellis never responded. I couldn't be sure if he even read the message because of an Instagram system that's set up so if the person you sent a message to doesn't follow you, you're deprived of a read receipt. I was left on something even less than read. In December 2017, filled with nervous desperation, I sent Brett another message, hoping he would give me permission to publish the novel. Again, he didn't respond. Again, I had no idea if he saw the messages, but I still had an 855-page novel that was unpublishable. I still have that novel. It's still unpublishable. Eight months of my life amounted to nothing. Or is it nothing? In White, Brett details his thoughts on the experience of writing a novel. I was the audience, and I was writing to satisfy myself and to relieve myself from pain. This is the post-Empire creative manifesto. Reading this was a reminder, and suddenly the anger I had at myself and at Brett merely dissipated. I took an inventory, and I realized that I no longer have a strong reaction regarding the 2016 election. The novel saved me. I didn't become one of those people obsessed with the Mueller investigation. I wasn't retweeting modified WWE gifs of CNN being body slammed by Trump. I was pretty okay with our governmental situation because Outrageous Mike released me from the pain that I had watched subsume some of the most rational people in my life. Sure, on first dates I'll still mimic the outrage that's echoed throughout the internet. They are literally putting children in cages, I will breathlessly shout. But in my heart, my true sentiments were painted on the back of Melania's coat. I've accepted that my novel will never see the light of day, and that's okay. Reading Brett's reminder of the post-Empire creative manifesto in white set me free from my grudge. Or, wait, didn't I start this essay saying I still have a grudge against him? I guess that's why I chose to write my feelings in this as a mix of a review, a personal essay, and I guess a think piece. White has a similar triplicate identity. Early in the book, Brett recounts seeing John Carpenter's The Thing at Crest Theater in Westwood, and he details his horror over the genuinely gruesome assimilations the film contained. White contains a similar assimilation of Pauline Kael's film reviews, Joan Didion's stark prose, and Brett's own sensibility, which was most successfully rendered in his now nearly dormant Twitter account. Unfortunately absent from this mix is the novelistic sensibilities that made a carnage-filled plane crash scene read so breathlessly, in the exact same way that Brett marvels about a brutal scene from Thomas Tyron's The Other within the first dozen pages of White. The opening pages of the collection read as an explanation or an apology to readers such as myself who were waiting for the next novel. It's a carefully worded return that, if it was being stripped down to an even more severe minimalism, would merely read, Listen, dude, I know you wanted a novel, but it's not happening. Deal with it. The filmmaker moves to TV, the comedian moves to podcasting, the novelist moves to essays. This is the post-empire erosion of art, where the ease of consumption trumps the pride of delivering the best possible product. In some corners, the author is relied upon to publish a book-like object, and Brett did, so I found myself like, at least this isn't some CW pilot that'll just sit on a MacBook forever. Uh, of course, a CW pilot does get mentioned in white, and of course, no information is given regarding what the pilot is actually about. The show that never was joins Outrageous Mike in the legally entangled purgatory that nothing is ever plucked from. I resent that this happens to authors. I'm so pissed that Brett kept investing his talents in projects that never materialized. The Golden Suicides, some Kanye shit, a Manson project with Rob Zombie. All while he could have been working on a novel that would have been produced not as a blind and futile hope, but as a demand from a publisher eager to put it into the world. I can't be certain, but I don't think that Brett ever mentions F. Scott Fitzgerald in White, but maybe it's too obvious a parallel. White is Brett's The Crack Up. At one point he even quotes the essay without attributing the quote, so maybe in the same way that I found Brett's words on my page for the election novel, he found Scott's words on his page for his election book. 
White is confessional in a way that Brett's novels are, but instead of the embarrassment that Fitzgerald was supposed to feel over the crack-up, Brett seemed to know that it wouldn't be the book that embarrassed him, but the reaction to the book. Ah, yes, the reaction. Isn't that what it's all about now? How can I spin this book to get me those retweets? What's the coolest meme I can conjure up to comment on a book that I'll never actually read? How can I be a dick in a way that appeals to the most people with the least amount of effort? I decided to go a different direction here, and I'll probably be made fun of for it. But both Brett and I want people to sack up, so let's start at home first. This essay is my reaction to White, and instead of 180 characters of sass, I'm hoping that my 5,000 words paints a clearer picture regarding Brett's latest work. One of the first pieces of press I saw for White was a Facebook ad sporting a comparison to the Didion essays of either Slouching Towards Bethlehem or the White Album. I don't remember which, and I'm not going to log into Facebook to find the post I'm referencing here. Deal with it. I didn't like the Didion comparison before I picked up White because it seemed like the ultimate boomer appeal. I mean, didn't one of those Didion collections contain a gushing piece about that cowboy guy that Twitter is like obsessively trying to destroy for interviews he did in the 1970s? I know you're probably like, hey dickhead, earlier in this essay you made the same Didion comparison, and you're right, I did. It wasn't until I actually read Alice's collection that I encountered Brett's brief recounting of his thoughts about Didion. Even beyond that, I understood why the publisher was using Didion as a springboard. White reminded me of Didion's essay titled, I Can't Get That Monster Out of My Mind, in which Didion, in a pre-disappear here world, was haunted by a line from a forgotten monster movie in which a female character recites the title of the piece, in reference to a monster walking the length of the East River, or something like that. Didion's piece tells of writers being chewed up by Hollywood. It tells of writers being convinced that their own creative failures were somehow Hollywood's fault. It tells of an industry where opportunity is consolidating, and the product being produced is plummeting when it comes to quality and individualism and voice. White is written from someone who, so often, has this monster on his mind. The monster led him on a casting couch relationship he mistook for genuine affection. The monster turned him to crowdfunding, offering cringy prizes. Work out with Brett, just to fund an adult drama. The monster now feasts on a steady diet of victim narratives, all except the narrative of the monster's victims. Hollywood the Destroyer, as Didion puts it. The land of inclusion and diversity, as Brett puts it. This reveals the main difference in Didion's Hollywood ruminations and Brett's view of the same parched landscape. Didion's Hollywood view is about the writer's identity, and Brett's Hollywood view is about the collective identity. Could the sidekick be a fat Mexican? Could the romantic lead be racially ambiguous and bisexual? Could we physically cripple Brian Cranston so we don't get the blowback from him playing someone in a wheelchair? Now, Hollywood asks these questions, because the fucking losers on the internet will force him to provide answers to these arbitrary ruminations whether they want to or not. What Ellis expertly outlines throughout his book is that victimization has always been something within Hollywood, but now it's driving the machine. It's the victimized gay black thug in the sterile hand job. It's the victimized underpaid woman hoisting an Oscar. It's the victimized Empire star planning his own victimization because he knows that some absolute asshole like Ellen Page will show up on Colbert's ever-absurd parody of itself show and blame the scam on the barely existing Mike Pence. This is Hollywood now. And it sucks. A gleaming bright spot in white is that Ellis was in Hollywood before this time, and he has stories. He was really fucking cool in the 80s and 90s, and it's a time when people could get away with so much more and people cared so much less. The beautiful nostalgia that paints White, from scamming Vanity Fair's Tina Brown with Judd Nelson, to coke chat with Basquiat, is told with amazing style. The suits, the booze, the coke, the actors interviewed, the articles written, the novels limped through, the nightclubs attended, and the nightclubs never actually attended despite confirmed sightings in the press. It's all here, and it's so damn fun to read. It's all about voice and style, and even if you don't agree with Ellis, it's easy to agree with how he's saying it. 
One aspect of White that was mostly lost on me until I finished the book and began considering writing this essay was how much quality information it contains for people who have unsolved mysteries regarding how a writer goes about performing his craft. The stock questions every writer hates to answer when they meet a fan. Where do you get your ideas? What's your writing routine? How long does a draft take you? How do you know when an idea is worth committing to? When did you realize that plot twist was going to happen? All of this is faithfully rendered in an articulate and interesting way, with examples that are reflected in the text. Everyone thinks they have a book in them, and after finishing White, most readers will be a small step closer to actually assembling that book. The post-Empire technique of drafting on pain for art is accurately rendered by Ellis, as is the notion that memory fades, but the novel is infinite. Brett readily admits that he's not totally sure if he really did attend a U2 concert in the Meadowlands with some Wall Street guys, but the possibility is there that it did happen, that American Psycho contained actual observations. This is how I look at my work, half-truths and forgotten nights. Ah yes, it only took me about 20 minutes to bring up American Psycho. Mentioned nearly 40 times in white, American Psycho is a specter that looms large over Ellis's observations, but the most interesting observation Ellis makes about the infamous novel is that he didn't realize he was doing anything shocking when he was writing the book. It wasn't until he handed a chapter of the manuscript to his then-boyfriend did Brett realize that he might be in some deep shit. To a reader who has never handed a book over to a confidant, the notion might seem disingenuous, but I can assure you that it happens, more than I'd like to admit. Now, self-censorship is part of a novelist's process. I think it was Paul Schrader, a frequent player in White, who said, Sometimes you have to kill your babies, and often you have to kill your favorite one. I bet he probably doesn't say that anymore because half the room will be like, It's a woman's choice to kill her favorite baby! While the other side of the room is like, You can never kill a baby, even if it's a mutant! So he probably just says fuck it and leaves the statement in the past. Then again, is he safe leaving the statement in the past? Does that protect anyone now? White argues that it should protect you, while also acknowledging that, well, it doesn't. Writers accept this now. We pivot. I'm guilty of digitally cleansing as much as anyone. In the wake of James Gunn's past tweet scandal, where Disney temporarily fired him from Guardians of the Galaxy 3, not another fucking Marvel movie, this new fear got the better of me, and I decided to delete my pop culture prose blog from the internet. I feared the mob and did exactly what they hoped their arbitrarily selected enemies will do. I downloaded the content from Tumblr, pre-porn purge, then removed every shred of writing from my site. Once again, feeling as though my writing would be a waste of time if not read, I created a loose plot to hang everything on, then assembled a novel that contained what I considered to be the best and safest elements of the blog. I sent it to my editor, and she responded back a month later with the following. I think to do a really funny book, you need to lose some of the anger, so I feel like I have to do a hatchet job on this. I'll try to go forward with the editing, but I'll be taking out a lot. You can observe my progress so far. In my opinion, a lighter touch is funnier. Maybe I'm not the right audience for this. The manuscript I submitted to my editor was tightly edited, toned down, muted. It's a toothless version of the prose from my mildly popular blog. I had removed every shred of possibly triggering content from the manuscript, then I sent it off. Getting this email back was more than a little concerning. All right, I can feel your attention waning. I know that you're saying to yourself, Homeboy told us he wasn't going to defend this fucking book, then he just spends a couple thousand words doing exactly that. And I guess that means it's time for me to mention what I didn't like about White. Honestly, I'd rather Kurt Cobain myself than use the word problematic in what already feels a hell of a lot like a think piece, so I'm going to list some observations that serve as a critique of Ellis's work. If you disagree with me, cool. I don't give a fuck. I mean... If you're reading this wondering if you want to shell out $15.57 for the book, then maybe this information will help you out. White speaks about a content-soaked culture we live in, yet succumbs to the same issues it proposes to expose. Peppered with empire flares, the collection is sometimes a snake eating its own tail. As a post-empire novelist, I read this book with the belief that it would likely align exactly with the framework of my understanding of the genre. 
This was not the case. Too often, Empire and Gen X flourishes stand out, and I'm all for taking a beating for being a millennial, but maybe Todd, Brett's longtime boyfriend, should have taken a pass at this manuscript and pointed out some Empire slivers. An early crack in the post-Empire veneer was when Brett brags about the fuck lot of money he received for writing a piece for Vanity Fair. He harps on the staggering amount, but never actually brings the receipt and tells us how much he got. The Empire fear of exposing the inner workings, telling tales out of school, is something that he later shits on Jed Nelson for, and if anything, proves how afraid these Gen Xers remain of divulging information that might cause a problem. This is replicated again later in the book, where another piece is written for another massive sum that is no longer offered, and he gets to brag without actually naming an amount. Another Empire facet of this book is that Brett finds the need to repeat past observations he made in fiction, and he now does so with far less art and coolness than before. The idea that everyone needs to know why the Babadook exists, or what made Michael Myers so stabby, or why does the main character choose the Chinese girl beyond just appealing to the identity politics crowd, is such an Empire notion that Brett himself hates. Yet, somehow, his rumitations on actors, they hide their true selves. They have to judge how much sex to put on the table at an audition. They are the most susceptible to criticism. All of this was presented in a more interesting and nuanced way in Brett's stellar Imperial Bedrooms. You want the post-Empire take on returning to Imperial Bedrooms? It's that Rain Turner is a dead ringer for Amber Heard, and given the massive clusterfuck of a scandal that is Amber's entire life, that's how you revisit it. It's the succubus with no clothing, the casting couch vixen turning the tables. Bye, Johnny. I'll collect my check on the way out. Hello, Elon. Could I see your rocket? Then there's the nagging question of, why am I reading this? This sensation is unavoidable in the doldrums moments of light, such as when we're provided what only can be described as a one-man recreation of the Mark Marin podcast. Brett seems to have copied and pasted Richard Gere's IMDb profile into the book's text, then provided small observations regarding various films that Gere starred in. Remember that first muse I discussed during the Empire Waste portion of this essay? She recently went and saw Times talk that Brett did about White, so I texted her, asking if anyone mentioned the gear section, and she responded, Yeah, he said that part would probs turn off anyone who's from the alt-right. Which is either Brett's weak rationalization for including it in the collection, or this was muse number one getting a sly dig about my political leanings in. I can't be sure, and I didn't press further for details. So often, I saw post-Empire solutions to the Empire portions of White. Occasionally, Brett would discuss problem guests his podcast had on. That Brett packed Ginger who felt like his questions were out of line. Jason Schwartzman being genuinely unable to answer a question like a human being. Judd Nelson ceaselessly playing a part. All of this is detailed in the book, but it's also detailed on the podcast, so it's not revelatory to a majority of this audience. The post-Empire solution to this would have been to go back to that ginger, and ask her where the fuck that memoir is that she claimed was keeping her from speaking about her relationships with Betty and Hughes. The post-Empire solution to this would be to go back to Jason Schwartzman and ask him, did it humiliate you that I started my podcast by mentioning that you seem almost entirely paralyzed and incapable of showing any signs of independent life, and that angry man you claim to be never leaned in toward the mic? The post-Empire solution would have been to go back to Judd and say, Hey, you never came back to the podcast like you said you were going to. Did it fuck you up, what I said about you, or are you still too scared? None of this is done, so it all feels Empire, even if it is dishy. This all leads us to the final issue, the most nagging issue. How much new information does this collection actually contain? Monologues from the podcast have been collaged into the collection, mashed together with the fictional Brett from Lunar Park's observations on Ellis's work. The number of times I experienced deja vu while reading White for the first time was a dizzying experience. Part of the post-Empire ethos is the acknowledgement that the work you're putting into the world arrives in a market so saturated, and into the hands of a public so distracted, that you simply can't afford to hand them the same thing twice. 
I often wondered if I bought the audiobook version of White instead of the novel. Would it contain chopped up, patched together clips from those podcasts I already listened to and occasionally even paid for? I know that there could be other factors at play here. The mortgages do. The podcasts are behind a paywall. There's this monster that I can't get out of my mind and I need to throw it something to chew on or I might no longer exist. Will it all fade to black if I don't move towards the white? So now, this is the point where I react to all the reactions to the book, right? Isn't that the YouTube shithole we found ourselves in? I record a reaction to some nerd reacting to the new Star Wars trailer. Isn't that how content works now? Copies of copies of copies, each less sincere and angrier than the last. The truth is, I didn't read that New Yorker piece on White, or New York Magazine, or whichever indistinguishable publication it was from. But, as I was blocking people on my Twitter feed who mentioned it, I was able to ascertain that the overwhelming opinion was that Brett got, quote, owned. My blocking of these dickheads in active social pruning is something that Brett bemoans in the opening chapters of White, that people are being erased for a single wrong tweet, but even after reading the book, I still find myself doing it, as recently as today. As evidenced by my own actions, I don't think White changed my behavior at all. I'm the same person I was when I first started the book, except for I'm no longer annoyed with Brett not responding to outrageous Mike. My anger faded as I made my way through Alice's latest, and it seems like everyone else's anger peaked as they closed the hardcover. I know that the book is a dialogue that demands a reaction. I know that one of the points Brett made is that I shouldn't block people for participating in this dialogue. I know this essay is narcissistic. Did he really try to sell his shitty Trump novel in the opening pages? I get it. I'm aware. I looked into White and I saw a reflection. For the first time in Ellis's career, he wrote a book that doesn't follow a fucked up, self-obsessed, casually detached, overprivileged main character, because, this time, that's the reader's role. Thank you for listening to the T. James Reagan Podcast.